I hope I'm audible. Please leave in the messages. I hope I'm audible. Okay. I welcome you all again to the uh, infectious syndrome based learn, learning. Uh, so today I wanted to try it a little differently. I wanted to try if it will work or if I directly put or post live on YouTube rather than having to Zoom. This is just a trial. You please leave your opinion regarding this. Uh, so today we'll be discussing about infective endocarditis. So basically uh, there has been a practice changing update in the infective endocarditis as I have discussed or uh, I have uh, in the as in the ECMED it was discussed and recently there has been an article. So again, I welcome you all to this uh, infective endocarditis unveiled. Uh, so without any further ado, let's start uh, with the uh, webinar. So but again, I will uh, I would like to start with a case. And in case of any questions or any doubts, please leave it in the chat. I am monitoring the YouTube chat as well. So don't hesitate to leave your comments or questions in the chat. So let's get started then. So infective endocarditis unveiled. So here I have a case, a 50 year old male, known type, known type two diabetes since 20 years on OHA. It is uncontrolled, his current HbA1c is 8.5%. He's hypertensive since four months, uh, diagnosed since four months. Uh, he had had a coronary artery disease with a, when he presented with acute coronary syndrome. And he has undergone stenting, that is a PTCA stenting in the emergency. And now he has come to us with all these comorbidities with history of fever since five days, burning maturation since five days, and flank pain since five days. Looking at the HOPI, the patient was apparently all right five days back when he developed fever, which was continuous high grade, but not documented, associated with chills and rigors. And there was burning maturation and increased frequency, but no history of hematuria. 
there was associated pain in the flank uh, region as well as lower back. This is uh, dilating, no aggravating or relieving factors along with loss of appetite. There is no history of any other history suggestive of respiratory complaints or your joint complaints, any no history of loss of weight or altered bowel habits. But his past history, when we looked at his records, so uh, basically in the month of August 2021, he had, had the chest pain with was uh, diagnosed to have a acute coronary syndrome with left circumflex artery block for which PTCA stenting was done. On uh, the next day of the stenting, PTCA uh, stenting was done. The next day is that he had an episode of fever with chest pain. There was, was uh, uh, the patient was kept rest for two to three days, but this fever was managed uh, symptomatically. Then in the, in the same uh, year, 2021, uh, September, he has history of on and off fever ever uh, since then. And uh, this has not been documented. In October, he again presented uh, to the uh, same hospital with chest pain. Uh, that time, uh, uh, he was thought to have um, the stent block. So that time, the 2D echo revealed LVAF of 45% mild LVH and uh, a trivial MRTR. And again, he was not. It turned out to be. Uh, it was not. A uh, block, but a uh, double uh, vascular disease, where uh, and for which again there was a stent placed. There was two stents now, and uh, it was a drug eluting stent. Stent. Again, the next month, in the month of November, he had history of fever, high grade chill, high grade fever with chills and rigors, which was continuous with no diurnal variation. So these are the uh, this picture depicts the various stents which have been placed in this patient. So uh, there's a, uh, basically the two stents, uh, that is uh, left circumflex stent uh, proximally and as well as distal. On examination, the patient is conscious and oriented to time, place and person. Uh, so his uh, CNS, RS was within normal limits. PA there were per abdomen examination showed that there was some lower abdominal pain with bilateral renal angle tenderness. There was no hepatosplenomegaly. CVS examination, there was no murmur. There was just tachycardia present. The patient was febrile. Uh, he was started on PIPTA suspecting a UT, a urinary tract infection because he's been having fever, chills, and burning with patient. He was started on PIPTA along with supportive management. This was a preliminary investigation which showed uh, the TLC was very high, 20,000, which was predominantly neutrophilic, 87% with the high uh, inflammatory markers. CRP was 166, Procal was 8, HbA1c 8.5%. His viral markers was, was negative. Urine showed as expected pus cells 50 to 60. RBCs were also there 10 to 12. USG abdomen was done because we were suspecting that the patient could have uh, pyelonephritis, which should reveal mild hepatosplenomegaly with bilateral enlarged kidneys. Uh, query uh, suggestive of your acute pyelonephritis, uh, pyelonephritis. Blood cultures were sent, which shockingly revealed three blood cultures, which were sent on different days. Basically, one set of blood culture was sent from the emergency. And the other said, well, as soon as the patient was shifted to the ward. So all of these grew GNB, that is Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So this Pseudomonas aeruginosa was uh, an MBL uh, producer, resistant to all, uh, uh, the, uh, all the antibiotics up to your carbapenems. So the, uh, the treatment was then changed to septazidum albactum plus astronam. Uh, we had good uh, synergy test, which was positive. So the provisional diagnosis which was made was complicated UTI along with acute pyelonephritis. So what was surprising in this was the patient had presented with bilateral pyelonephritis, which is a very rare thing. Usually the pyelonephritis is unilateral. Most, most often it is unilateral. So bilateral, whenever you think of bilateral pyelonephritis, there could be either obstructive cause, which could be near the urethra causing the bilateral uh, pyelonephritis. Otherwise, it could be the hematogenous prep. 
So we had a high suspicion the patient could have infective endocarditis. So we uh, sent the patient for 2D echo. So with that, we'll be now jumping to the infective endocarditis. So uh, diagnosis of infective endocarditis, first and foremost, relies on your suspicion. So I will be discussing in further slides when to suspect infective endocarditis. As we all know, the diagnostic modality of choice for infective endocarditis relies on two things. First and foremost is your blood culture. Second is your uh, echocardiography. So in, whenever infective endocarditis is suspected, based on the patient risk and the clinical suspicion, if it is low, we can go for transthoracic echocardiography. If there is, uh, if it is positive or there is high risk echo features, we'll have to treat for infective endocarditis. If the risk is, or the clinical suspicion is moderate to high, you can do transthoracic followed by transesophageal as soon as positive, uh, as soon as possible. So high initial patient risk, these are the group which has prosthetic heart valves, congenital heart disease, previous endocarditis, any new murmur, heart failure or other six stigma of endocarditis. High risk echocardiography features include large mobile vegetation, valvular insufficiency, suggestion of um, uh, perivalvular extension, etc. So the patient's 2D echo, that is transthoracic echo, showed us no vegetation. Because we had high suspicion of endocarditis, we subjected the patient to transesophageal echo, which showed the vegetation in the posterior mitral leaflet of the mitral valve, measuring six into four mm, confirming or which is suggest the vegetation was suggestive of infective endocarditis. So when we look at the role of 2D echo in infective endocarditis, first and foremost is for the diagnosis purpose, which I've already discussed. So when your initial mode can be the transthoracic. But if you are having high suspicion, you have to go for transesophageal. Also, TTE should, uh, most of the situation should be followed by TEE because uh, to rule out the complications, certain vegetations are better appreciated, certain complications are better appreciated on your transesophageal echo. So uh, then when you have to repeat the echocardiography, you have to go for TE after positive TTE. You know, uh, to rule out the high risk of, for which are, uh, have complications. And if uh, initial T transthoracic is negative, you have to repeat the TE. And even if T is negative, if the suspicion is high, you can go for repeat echo in a duration of three to five days. Then intraoperatively also echo is useful. It is useful for identification of vegetation, mechanism of regurgitation, looking for any abscess of fistula. For confirmation, so you have that they will do the surgery, repair of the fistula or abscess or any removal of the vegetation to confirm the successful repair of these findings. And 2D echo must be done after uh, or whenever you plan to stop the infective endocarditis uh, antibiotics to uh, ensure that the vegetation has reduced or disappeared. Next. To establish, so the, once the patient has been diagnosed with infective endocarditis or if the surgery has been performed, you need to establish another baseline for valve function and morphology and ventricular size for what again you have to do. So this is a question. So maybe you can use the chat option again here. So typical organism consistent with infective endocarditis include all except. So let me check if all of you are responding. Okay, I'm not. Okay, so let's just continue. Uh, so obviously it is streptococcus pneumonia, staph aureus, enterococcus, streptococcus bovis have been included. So this is as per the modified due criteria 2015. Uh, they have in, the typical microorganisms include virid and streptococcus, streptococcus bovis, HACEC group, Staphylococcus aureus, and community acquired enterococci in the absence of primary focus. And one important fact which I have been stressing in my previous webinars is all patients with Staphylococcus aureus, bacteremia, or candidemia will require echocardiography ideally within first week of the treatment or within 24 hours if there is evidence suggestive of infective endocarditis. 
So when we look at the modified group criteria, this was the modified group criteria. So let's see how our case fits in. So what was the organism in our patient? It was Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Is it a typical organism? No, it is not one of the typical organism. So your positive blood culture criteria is not met for major criteria. Then, the, 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 so the criteria said that typical organism in two separate blood culture or persistently positive blood culture defined as recovery of microorganism consistent with infective endocarditis drawn 12 hour apart or all or three, all of the three or majority of four separate cultures drawn one hour apart or a single positive blood culture for coxilla bronchi. And next is the uh, echo, positive echocardiogram uh, uh, showing your vegetation or abscess or partial valve disease. So one of the major criteria was met. Then macular pen phenomena. Uh, so we had subjected the patient to, uh, there was vascular phenomena in my major arterial when no, the was not met. The patient had fever, no predisposition, heart condition was there. Uh, we had subjected the patient to the ophthalmoscopic examination, which revealed Rot spot and microbiological evidence not meeting the major criteria. So one major and two, uh, one major and three minor criteria was met. So just for the sake of information, so how so the various phenomena which we see in infective endocarditis or the peripheral signs of infective endocarditis. This is your osseous node. So what is osseous node? Where it, where do you see these osseous nodes? It is found at the pulp of the fingers or the toes. They are basically Pin had to pin uh, P size and they are painful, pink to purple color. And this is due to the deposition of the immune complexes. So these are the Janeway lesions. These are flat, painless, red to bluish red uh, spots seen on palms and soles. Then other uh, major uh, arterial emboli, so which can result in a uh, stroke or it can uh, result in uh, painful uh, uh, gangrene or the per peripheral thrombosis can be there. Then your rod spots, these rod spots are nothing but white centered retinal hemorrhages that are considered pathognomic of your subacute uh, bacterial endocarditis. So let's, so if you actually look into our condition, our patient, uh, he, he is not, uh, he is just uh, satisfying the modified Duke's criteria. Uh, so uh, to address these challenges, they have modified this Duke criteria. This is the update, 2023 Duke ICSVID, Equit Criteria for Infective Endocarditis. So this has been published recently in your clinical infectious diseases. So let's look into the various changes they have made in this. So first and foremost, for microorganism identification, they have included uh, 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 PCR, amplicon or metagenomic sequencing or se uh, to hybridization apart from the cultures. So cultures were already there. Apart from this, we can identify the organism by uh, appropriate sample by PCR or metagenomic sequencing. So this is a welcome move because uh, further on, we will be moving towards more of metagenomics as well as sequencing. Next, in the major clinical criteria, they have added the one new criteria, just a surgical criteria, which was actually not evident in the previous, I would say. Um, so this surgical criteria includes uh, whether when intraoperative inspection um, in the absence of uh, the major criteria by cardiac imaging or the histopath, basically. So Surgery, uh, the surgeon will observe the infective endocarditis during the surgery. Next, in the microbiological criteria, they have removed the requirements of timing and separate venipentures for the blood cultures. So they have removed this. So the timing where 12 hour apart, one hour apart, it is always confusing. So they have totally removed this. The only thing is you have to demonstrate persistent bacteremia. So how so by the multiple cultures. So two cultures in a typical organism, in atypical organisms, at least three uh, positive set. So three, <coughs> so one set composes of one aerobic plus one anaerobic culture. And any of these uh, two bottles flagging for any organism is counted as one set positive. So if two set is positive, 
in for typical microorganism and three for other organism so what are they defining as a typical organism so they are apart from the usual list which i have showed before they have added these organisms that is staph lugdunensis which you, which we all know behaves as a uh, good or as uh, bad as your staph aureus your enterococcus faecalis they have removed the requirement of community or this or uh, healthcare acquired all streptococci except your streptococcus pneumonia and streptococcus pyogenes this again i'll be discussing further why they have excluded these two organisms your uh, no, uh, nutritional variant nutritionally variant uh, streptococci species that is your granulocotyla abiotrophia gemmilla species and organisms to be considered typical in the setting of intracardiac prosthetic materials so as we move along uh, so we will have more of these stent surgeries as well as your um, uh, multiple cardiac uh, uh, devices will which will be put in uh, uh, in the patient so uh, it is necessary to include these uh, organisms as typical these includes your corns Corynebacterium striatum, Corynebacterium gecum, Cerasia mastacensis, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Cutibacterium acnes, Entium, Canada species, etc. So these they have included as a typical organisms list. So if if you see in our uh, our patient, so Pseudomonas aeruginosa uh, has grown. So obviously this it will satisfy easily the uh, the microbiological criteria for the uh, in case of modified duke uh, duke equid criteria so uh, they have added other uh, microbiological tests like i have said before pcr as well as metagenomic sequencing uh, for uh, identification of foxella burnetti bartonellol or trophidema vipli uh, ifa titers of more than 1 is to 800 for uh have bartonella hensley and bartonella quintana imaging changes they have included one imaging that is cardiac uh, ct uh, so this has been added in the new major criteria similar to the thought of your echocardiography then they have also added ftg pet ct which has been added under major criteria so uh fire, similar to that of your uh, uh so there will be some uptake in the native valve or the cardiac device or the prosthetic valve the positive pet findings or the uptake more than 3 months after the surgery is included in major criteria whereas the positive pet ct findings in within 3 months because within 3 months uh, 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 there can be some uptake due to the inflammatory reasons as well rather than the infection so first 3 months they have included it on the minor criteria and after 3 months if there is any abnormal uptake in the car, uh, in the valve or native valve or the prosthetic valve or the cardiac device it is considered as abnormal and satisfies the major criteria other minor criteria in vascular phenomena they have included splenic and cerebral abscesses in predisposing features so we had seen lot of a uh, condition where infective endocarditis is predisposed they have added transcatheter valve implants endovascular ciad as well as prior diagnosis of ie in immunologic phenomena they have added the glomerulonephritis and in the minor microbiological criteria they have added pcr or amplicon uh, involving other than typical uh, pathogen imaging as i have already mentioned pet ct evidence within 3 months of cardiac surgery so physical examination also has been added under minor clinical criteria that is in the absence of uh, like uh, non availability of echocardiography new auscultation of regurgitant murmur also has been added under the minor criteria so pet scan in a patient we did so the patient it showed an heterogeneous ftg uptake along the stent in the proximal uh, left circumflex artery so but there was no vegetation so what is the role of pet ct in infective endocarditis so this is a very good article or a meta analysis in native valve when we look at compare the sensitivity of pet in native valve endocarditis that sensitivity as you can see is quite low now when you specificity is very good for native valve endocard infective endocarditis but when you compare the same thing with project well it has a good sensitivity as well as specificity for cid that is your um, 
uh, intra cardiac devices endocarditis the sensitivity is plus as well as specificity is plus minus so that is why pet ct is not very useful in native valve infective endocarditis it's because it has a low sensitivity of 31% in case of pve it is a quite good with a good sensitivity of 82% specificity of 96% and npv of 87% so fdg pet ct combined with the te that is trans esophageal echo increases the diagnostic yield in CIAD infective endocarditis. So, when to suspect infective endocarditis? So, this has been beautifully given in this BSAC guidelines for in, uh, endocarditis. It is British Society for Antimicrobial, Steward, uh, Antimicrobial Chemotherapy. Uh, in AHA, uh, the comprehensive diagnosis as well as antimicrobial therapy for individual endo endocarditis as well as ESC guidelines. So these are uh, three major guidelines I've used for further slides. So when to suspect infective endocarditis? We must suspect infective endocarditis whenever the patient is having febrile illness and a murmur of new valvular regurgitation. Fe uh, febrile illness with pre-existing cardiac uh, uh, lesion and no other obvious site of infection. And if uh, there is a fever with a uh, recent intervention associated with bacteremia, fe fever with congestive heart failure. Usually congestive heart failure will not have fever. So if the patient is having this fever, we have to suspect fever with any vascular immunological ph phenomena, stroke. Fever when the patient is stroke, suspect infective endocarditis because stroke uh, usually uh, apart from certain type of stroke, there are other strokes will not have fever. Peripheral abscesses like unexplained abscesses, splenic abscesses, cerebral abscesses with fever. And any patient with protracted history of fever, sweats, weight loss, anorexia, and an at-risk uh -huh, cardiac lesion, and any new unexplained embolic event, that is cerebral ischemia or limb ischemia, the patient coming with unknown uh, embolic event, we have to think of infective endocarditis unexplained persistently positive blood cultures and after uh, so suppose we had one patient with uh, uh, crbsi even after removing the source that is the removal of the catheter if the blood culture is still persistently positive after 72 hours we have to think of infective endocarditis so again to do 2D echo, this, uh, these are various scores. I have dealt uh, about staff orders, that is where star score predicts score or positive score in detail in my uh, previous webinar, as well as enterococcus fecalis, NOVA, as well as de NOVA score, streptococci Hancock score, which I'll be showing. So this is for indications for trans esophageal echo. So whenever we're suspecting endocarditis, all the patient of staff should undergo trans thoracic. Enterococcus fecalis, if there is no source, should undergo minimum transthoracic. If the score is more than three, uh, four, we have to go for trans esophageal echo, echo, endo, uh, echocardiography. So, next important question which uh, everyone faces is what empiric antibiotic in a patient? who has, we have suspecting infective endocarditis. So first and foremost, we'll have to look uh, apart from your, um, uh, the risk factor for your infective endocarditis. So in, and based on that, you will have certain organisms which are common in that. So based on the organisms, which is uh, there, we'll have to cover those organisms in the air. Uh, as a part of empiric antibiotic therapy. So if the patient is an intravenous drug abuser, most commonly it is by staph aureus, uh, scones, beta hemolytic streptococci, um, indwelling cardiovascular devices, staph aureus, aerobic GNDs will become common here, including the coronary bacterium. If the patient had a previous history of genital urinary disorder or infection or manipulation, pregnancy, your endococcus group B streptococci, such as uh, that is your galaxia, dysteria, can becomes important. Chronic skin disorders, including recurrent infection, we have to think about your staph aureus. Poor dental hygiene or dental procedures, we'll have to think about your um, uh, uh, viridens group streptococci, including your uh, NBS, as well as HACEC group, etc. So this there is a big list which has been given. 
So even in prosthetic valve endocarditis, if it is depending upon the prosthetic valve is early or late, you can uh, that your organisms can vary. So early you have corn, staph aureus, GNBs, fungi, etc. Whereas late it is more of corn, staph aureus, viridens, group enterococcus. Dog or cat exposure, your Taptocytophagia, Pasturella, Bartonella. In AIDS, we have to also think about atypical organisms like your Salmonella, Streptococcus pneumoniae, etc. So whenever we are looking at empiric antibiotic, first we have to decide uh, whether is it a native valve or prosthetic valve. Next, we have to look at whether the local data about the common organisms uh, though there is uh, the common organism for infective endocarditis continues to be streptococci, uh, there is increasing data for staph aureus endocarditis. And then based on the risk and the hemodynamic stability of the patient, uh, you'll have to decide. So a patient with native valve endocarditis with having, uh, he is totally hemodynamically stable. You can just uh, wait, send the cultures and wait for the report. In native valve endocarditis, hemodynamically unstable, but there is no risk factor for MBR organism. Uh, you can give ampicillin or ampicillin plus dentamycin. If it is healthcare, healthcare associated vancomycin plus dentamycin or septagen can be considered. If there are risk factors for GNBs, I mean multi drug resistant GNBs, vancomycin plus meropenem can be given, meropenem or cefepime can be given. Uh, uh, prosthetic valve endocarditis, when we are suspecting and the patient is hemodynamically unstable, we can give vancomycin with gentamicin, uh, vancomycin, gentamicin with cefepime. Rifampicin can be considered to be added after three to five days of this therapy. So, antimicrobial therapy in infective endocarditis is challenging. Uh, it is not equivalent to a bloodstream infection plus and uh, some vegetation. Uh, so, primary goal of antibiotic therapy is to eradicate infection, including sterilization of the vegetation. We have to give prolonged parenteral bactericidal therapy to uh, cure the infection. The difficulty is because the penetration of the antibiotics into the um, vegetation is poor. Also, there is something called inoculum effect. So, that is why your beta lactams and glycopeptides can be less effective, whereas fluoroquinolones and amino uh, glycoside are least affected by these antibiotics, uh, by, the, by the phenomenon of in inoculum effect. Right-sided endocarditis have lower bacterial density, density due to the host mechanism. And the duration of therapy is counted from the first day on which the blood culture was negative. Rather, so if the blood culture was positive today and you started the therapy uh, and after on the fifth day, the blood cultures have become sterile, you will count six weeks or four weeks from the day the blood culture has become sterile. And we have for that, you have to send two sets of blood culture every 24 to 48 hours until the bloodstream or the infection is cleared. Then if the patient is subjected to surgery and the operative cultures become positive, you have to repeat the entire duration. So a patient of infective endocarditis and the patient uh, was uh, given antibiotics for two weeks and then later uh, he was he underwent surgery and the vegetation was sent for culture. And if the vegetation is positive, you have to give the two weeks of therapy is considered nullified and you have to give further four to six weeks. So the phases of antibiotic therapy or uh, treatment in infective endocarditis, the initial two weeks is called early critical phase. So usually you will give, uh, better to give IV rapidly bactericidal combination, uh, combination therapy and uh, cardiac surgery can, if, can be done if it is indicated. Then we have continuation phase, which is from two to uh, up to six weeks, depending upon the type of organism and type of endocarditis. Um, so the way, what are the indications for surgery? Just a second. <coughs> So early valve surgery, left infective endocarditis or native valve endocarditis is required when there is valve dysfunction, 
when you are having highly drug resistant or organisms like mdr gram negative organism or vre or fungi if there is any complications like um, heart block abscess etc if there is persistent infection that is the persistent bacteremia or fever has not cleared even after one week of antibiotic therapy if there is any recurrent emboli or persistently enlarging vegetation severe valvular regurgitation and mobile vegetation more than 10 mm mobile vegetation more than 10 mm if especially if it is involving anterior leaflet of mitral valve in case of prosthetic valve if any symptom of heart failure or any complication is there collapsing uh, prosthetic valve endocarditis in right sided infective endocarditis um, usually sir, the patients as i have mentioned before the vegetations are usually smaller and the post mecum um, innate immunity will take care of it and the outcomes are better if there is any heart failure or the tricuspid vegetation is more than 20 mm we'll have to go for surgery so follow up as i mentioned after starting the therapy we will have to repeat the echocardiography and monitor for the uh, size of the vegetation and before you stop the therapy again we have to do to look at the vegetation size a thorough dental evaluation with uh, uh, and uh, should be done and so that all the active oral infection is eradicated in case the patient is an in injection drug abuser you have to do the de addiction and um, removal of all the indwelling catheters and whenever we are giving long term aminoglycoside therapy we have to do the gram and renal toxicity monitoring our uh, relapses can occur so we have to keep uh, vigilant on these patient so any infective endocarditis has a good the 20 to 30% chance of uh, reoccurrence so whenever there a patient is having any new onset fever chills um we'll have to repeat the evaluation through thorough history as well as physical examination with sending blood cultures antimicrobial therapy should not be initiated for any undefined febrile illness until the patient is in very severe condition so now let's talk about few important points or uh, uh, pertaining to the important organisms causing infective endocarditis first and foremost your staph aureus the treatment of choice for native valve endocarditis caused by your msa is nafcillin or oxycillin or fluoxetine if it the penicillin allergic you can go for cefazolin if it is mrsa vancomycin or daptomycin the duration of therapy is 6 weeks there is uh, no need to add gentamicin or rifampicin for native valve endocarditis and in case of brain abscess we should go for nafcillin only um daptomycin is a reasonable alternative if uh for treatment of uh, mrsa obviously but even in mssa if the patient is having recurrent or re persistent bacteremia in prosthetic valve endocarditis uh, for on staph aureus we have to give combination therapy and gentamicin should be administered for first two weeks so the treatment modality for mssa will be nafcillin plus or nafcillin or oxycillin plus rifampicin plus gentamicin for mrsa it would be vancomycin plus rifampicin plus gentamicin gentamicin will remain for 2 weeks and up to 6 weeks is compulsory and then depending upon the patient you can extend beyond 6 weeks as well so this is uh, according to the bsac there is not much difference it, uh, they have uh, uh, provided properly fluoxetine next streptococcal infective endocarditis so this is the various groups based on the phylogenetic relationship mites group salivarius group anginosis group mutans group pyogenic group as well as the bovis group uh, so infective endocarditis prevalence varies depending upon the type of the streptococci so if you see the red color indicates very high risk of infective endocarditis and green indicates a uh, low risk for infective endocarditis and why is there a difference in these species one thing is uh, there have uh, there have been studies which have proven that this uh, low virulent organisms as well as the oral streptococci these have uh, ability to produce uh, a dextran because they are as a part of normal oral flora uh, enamel 
uh, to uh, adhere over that they produce this text strand and this uh, for, uh, this in turn is enabling these organism to adhere to the valves so when, when infective endocarditis the basic pathology is first and foremost is any abnormal 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 valves or abnormal flow next is uh because of this abnormal valve or abnormal flow there will be a formation of a mass which is based on your throm uh, with thrombus will form that is your non bacterial uh, thrombotic uh, uh, vegetation will be there that is uh, which will have your platelets your fibrin etc then this ongoing uh, bacteremia or the bacterial seeding will happen ultimately leading to infective endocarditis so the uh, the adhesion into the onto the valves is maximum by your oral streptococci and these are relatively less in case of your streptococcus pneumoniae as well as pyogenes and that is why these organisms will not cause more of infective endocarditis and that is the reason streptococcus pyogenes and streptococcus pneumoniae have are not included in that of in the um, modif uh, duke equit criteria so this is the hand of score so this is for non beta hemolytic streptococcal bacteremia hand of h stands for heart murmur or valvular disease that is presence of uh, valvular disease a for etiology that is um, the major groups which i have given so if it is mutans bovis sanguinis will have plus one other streptococcal zero say uh, anginosis group will have minus one number of culture positive blood culture more than equal to 2 will have one point duration of the symptoms more than equal to 7 days will get one point only one species identified in the blood culture one point and if it is a community acquired infection one point so if the score is more than equal to 3 it has a very high sensitivity as well as specificity including very good negative predictive value for uh, 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 suspecting infective endocarditis and hence we have to go for trans esophageal echo coming to the treatment of choice so this is a esc guideline for uh, the treatment of the streptococcal streptococcal infection depends upon the penicillin mic if the strain is penicillin susceptible penicillin or amoxicillin or ceftriaxone can be given um and the duration for, for streptococcal infection is 4 weeks next if uh you want to give for a shorter duration of time so then uh you can add gentamicin that is if the patient is hemodynamically stable and you think the patient will not require prolonged course you can add uh, gentamicin to the therapy and give it for 2 weeks in case of beta lactam allergy a uh, allergic patient vancomycin will become the drug of choice so which the strains which are relatively resistant to penicillin that is the MIC is a little higher size from 0.25 to 2. Then uh, we have to give a higher dose of penicillin or amoxicillin or ceftriaxone combined with gentamicin, and the duration of therapy is four weeks here, and in which two weeks is out of your gentamicin. If beta lactam allergic, gentamicin plus gentamicin should be given for four weeks. so this is the uh, the aha guidelines again it is uh, in the similar lines and uh, it is again based on the penicillin mic which we have to give importance to and if the penicillin mic is less than equal to 0.125 you can go for monotherapy if it is in between uh, it is more than 0.125 we have to go for high dose higher dose of penicillin along with your uh, amino glycoside therapy for your prostatic valve endocarditis uh, in case of your streptococcus group uh, again we have to definitely go with combination with your uh, amino glycoside that is the gentamicin and the duration of therapy is 6 weeks of which 2 weeks is that of your gentamicin in case penicillin is relatively or fully resistant we have to give um, your penicillin ceftriaxone or ceftriaxone with gentamicin for it total duration of 6 weeks next coming to enterococcal infective endocarditis again this i have discussed in detail in my previous webinar so de novo score we have already already familiar with it uses six criteria and a 
more than equal to three cutoff has a very good sensitive sensitivity and specificity of one hundred and eighty five percent. So uh, D no go. D stands for duration of symptoms more than seven, evidence of embolization, N for number of uh, um, positive blood cultures that is two or more, unknown source or origin of the bacteremia. V stands for prior heart valve disease. A for the auscultation of the murmur. Treatment of infective endocarditis due to enterococci. Um, again, if it is beta lactam and gentamicin susceptible strain, uh, the first and foremost ampicillin or amoxicillin with uh, uh, genta, uh, gentamicin is a preferred choice. If the patient has any um, increased, uh, there is no, again, you will have to look at the synergy test, which I have already again discussed in detail. If there is no synergy present, or if there is any issue with the renal clearance, you can go for ampicillin plus ceftriaxone. And if they are resistant to your, uh, intrinsically resistant to your uh, uh, penicillins, um, then vancomycin plus gentamicin can be given. Uh, this is again, so for in, uh, infected endocarditis due to endococci, there is no difference. We have to give combination therapy with the gentamicin for both your native valve as well as your prosthetic valve endocarditis. Duration of therapy uh, is four to six weeks for native valve and six weeks for your prosthetic valve. In case the, uh, there is uh, vancomycin, uh, uh, I mean, aminoglycoside susceptible penicillin resistant strain, we can go for vancomycin plus gentamicin as a therapy. Next, a brief note on HACET group. Uh, has a group organism, unless your institute is providing, uh, doing the susceptibility, uh, it which again, as we all know, it is difficult to cultivate as well. And obviously, it is even more difficult to put up the susceptibility test. So they are considered to be ampicillin resistant as well as um, uh, ampicillin resistant. That's why uh, penicillin and ampicillin should not be used for treatment. So eftriaxone is reasonable and for native well for four weeks as well as uh, for prosthetic valve well, for six weeks. Additional gentamicin is not preferred in HACEC group. Uh, if the patient is having any, any allergic reaction or to cannot tolerate ceftriaxone, fluoroquinolone is a uh, reasonable alternative. Ampicillin can be given because uh, as we all know, HACEC group, again, there is a lot of beta lactamase production as well. non hasek GNB, these are the common group which is increasing nowadays as an and as i mentioned this is a common group in your device associated infections uh, these organisms include your pseudomonas your e coli salmonella etc and most of these will have some sort of healthcare exposure and hence higher multi drug resistance and with the high mortality as well uh, and most of these will require Drugs, combination of drugs, which include your aminoglycosides or even cholestin. That is why uh, uh, they will have less favorable outcomes. And the general therapy or general rule is we have to give combination therapy with beta lactam plus an aminoglycoside or a fluoroquinolone for six weeks. So beta lactam, depending upon your susceptibility, if it is um, obviously, most of them will be resistant to your penicillin. Your it can be your ceftriaxone or cefepime or carbapenem with am amikacin can be given. So next, uh, just a word on culture negative infective on carditis. First and foremost, cause of infective culture negative infective endocarditis is prior antibiotics. So if at all we are suspecting infective endocarditis and the patient has been given antibiotics from before it and the patient is hemodynamically stable it is preferred that you stop the therapy to five uh, for five to seven days then repeat the blood cultures and again as uh, as, uh, as per the new update we can send for your uh, pcr or the sequencing which will again help in isolation or uh, finding out the uh, bacterial or any etiology in cases of the patients who have received prior antibiotics Apart from that, uh, if there is a high suspicion, uh, we will have to look for all other causes of culture negative endocarditis like brucella. Brucella, we can send blood cultures. Brucella, SAT should be sent. Again, uh, blood cultures are ideal, but uh, if the patient, uh, if it is not growing, we have to, it's reasonable to do a prolonged incubation 
and you have to repeat uh, uh re send repeated culture and then if you are doing sat you have to repeat after four weeks to look for the increase um pcr can be done coxella bernetti serology uh serology or tissue culture or pcr can be done bartonella again similar cultures it's very difficult to isolate so pcr in uh, or serology is ideal trophorama vipuli we have, there are lot of um, actually there may be a lot of the lot many cases of trophorama vipuli endocarditis which we are missing because it is generally not isolated obviously as well as um, histology or pcr is also not freely available mycoplasma legionella are other things which we have to keep in mind increasing uh, risk of uh, I mean increasing cases of fungal infective endocarditis is has been reported these are associated with mortality in the range of 30 to 40% and these will require surgery uh, and most of the time uh, especially your candida can easily grow in grow in blood culture but others will require pcr non bacterial thrombotic endocarditis is again one important uh, uh, differential for your culture negative infective endocarditis so we have to think about this if the in a patient and send uh, these uh, factors so any patient with a uh, secondary uh, with a, uh, with a risk factor for secondary hypercoagulable status like your sle your hiv uh, are at the high risk for your nbt so these patients if we can diagnose uh, there will be uh, the unnecessary antibiotics which will be given for 6 weeks can be avoided so is oral treatment effective for infective endocarditis so we had this study uh, published in anjm partial oral versus intravenous antibiotic therapy so if you can see the oral therapy had a lower probably um uh, mortality when compared to that of your iv so the primary outcome all cause death unplanned surgery embolic events relapse all were lower in oral group compared to that of uh, intravenous group even after 3.5 years see the difference was maintained and there was no uh, the relapses were similar in both the groups now then we have this study rodeo 1 and 2 uh, which is on the way now so where they will be comparing um, the uh, oral switch versus standard iv antibiotic therapy in left sided uh, staph infection in case of rodeo 1 and rodeo 2 will have the same thing for your uh, streptococci as well as your enterococci so this is the planned protocol so diagnosis where they will start the initial iv therapy or any surgery if it is planned and after at least 10 to 14 days that is two weeks of iv antibiotics uh, they will be switched over to oral or iv therapy and compared next we also have outpatient oral versus parenteral Uh, antimicrobial therapy for infective endocarditis so instead of keeping the patient admitted for 4 to 6 weeks opat therapy is one again uh, um, can be considered or uh, they in the so previously they were comparing oral versus iv parenteral therapy this study that is a games or a pat ie games trial is comparing opat versus oral therapy this again this uh, study is on the way so is 6 weeks iv therapy required in all infective endocarditis obviously no 6 4 to 6 weeks so this is sati trial which is again on the way so short course antibiotic therapy compared to conventional therapy for gram positive cocci infective endocarditis sati so uh, after uh, so here what they are comparing is uh, the experimental group will get short course of antibiotic of only 2 weeks whereas a control group will get antibiotics of 4 to 6 weeks and then they will be comparing the data so next last part is antimicrobial prophylaxis so who should get antimicrobial prophylaxis so after the diagnosis of infective endocarditis in a patient we need to keep him on antimicrobial prophylaxis so which patients of infective endocarditis should receive prophylaxis 
फर्स्ट इज एनी पेशेंट विथ एनी प्रोस्थेटिक वैल्व should get prophylaxis antibiotic prophylaxis previous infective endocarditis any congenital heart disease with uh, which is cyanotic or which has uh, any uh, recent surgical procedure or residual shunt is there for other type of congenital heart disease may not be required but uh, certain types of congenital cyanotic congenital heart require uh, heart disease will require antibiotic prophylaxis so what procedures will require um uh, uh, your antimicrobial prophylaxis is not that any procedure or which is done should the patient should be given antibiotic dental procedures is one thing which will require antimicrobial prophylaxis respiratory tract procedures in general it is not recommended for any procedures like uh, common procedures like bronchoscopy gi procedures it is not recommended including your cystoscopy delivery uh, colonoscopy etc skin and soft tissue infection not recommended so only in case of a dental procedures uh, where it will require manipulation of the gingival or periapical region or perforation of oral mucosa it is recommended in normal procedures like local anesthetic injection or just uh, treatment of superficial caries just removal dental x-rays all this will not required so what should be given is your plain amoxicillin 2 gram oral or clinda mycin can be given and uh, this will be my last slide so infective endocarditis it uh, as much as it there is a part of antimicrobial therapy as or the surgery it is necessary that you keep the patient well informed about how to take care so we have the patient has to be advised to visit dentist every 6 months keep good dental hygiene stop smoking healthy diet should be taken and prevent or skin or wound infection and he has to visit an healthcare professional whenever there is some suspected skin lesion because as i have mentioned infective endocarditis is very prone for relapses and ideally it is necessary that the patient carries a card the card saying that he has had infective endocarditis so because uh, such patients if they develop any fever and this history is not revealed outside there is a general tendency to start on antibiotics even before evaluation and uh, we have to explain the symptoms like whenever he has fever chills fatigue malaise or flu like symptoms they have to come and visit and uh, there should be high suspicion of in uh, uh, a uh, infective endocarditis in these patients so thank you that's about today's session i wanted to include much more slides just uh, maybe i will have a second round where i'll be including other uh, important things on infective endocarditis so infective endocarditis is a very broad topic so today i have dealt about the uh, when to suspect how and empiric therapy and how to manage few important uh, infective endocarditis causing organisms uh, then the next part uh, like which is important is the management of the complications and uh, if at all you require any class on pathogenesis again that is one big uh, uh, thing pathogenesis of infective endocarditis so if you have any doubts please put up in the chat uh, i i will be able to take questions let's see if you have any questions okay if there are no questions you can leave the questions in my whatsapp group or whatsapp chat as well in case you want to ask anything so if there are no questions let's send it thank you everyone